like match the following important lakes in india with their associate significance first one sambar lake largest freshwater lake in india second one loktak lake the only floating national park in the world third koleru lake largest coastal lagoon in india and fourth one bemban lake longest lake in india so this i guess kindly mark your option and uh, this is something very easy i don't think it is a bit difficult or tricky so most of you would have already known the options and it is simple like if you see koleru it is already uh, there in andhra pradesh and you know that koleru is a fresh water lake it's not an uh, salt water lake because salt water is pulikat lake so obviously koleru is a fresh water so that's why third option is wrong and then you have uh, loktak lake that you all know it is famous in manipur like it is a only floating national park in the world and it is very very famous and there was already a prelims question on this asking about that animal uh, a special unique animal that is uh, associated with this park that is kimbul limjau national park kimbul limjau national park kimbul limjau national park is that national park name and that deer name is sangai deer so these are the two things that are associated with that loktak lake that's how second one is very famous so second one is also correct here the first one is where it is wrong because sambar lake it is in rajasthan so you can't expect a fresh water lake in middle of rajasthan and it is a complete salt water lake instead so that's why the first option is wrong so here the right answer would be it the option is 2 and 4 but unfortunately uh, it should be the d2 and 4 but it is 1 and 4 kindly correct that so it is d2 and 4 so if you would have someone marked 2 and 4 or at least near to that mark yourself as correct okay now we'll see the different things like the context of why this came is because there were a huge deaths of migratory birds in that sambar lake and the reason for that is avian botulism okay and then what is this avian botulism this is basically a neuromuscular illness that is caused by an bacteria that is that bacteria produces a toxin in that lake or in any water body so usually what happens is whenever uh, the temperature is about 21 degrees and there are certain conditions these bacteria called clostridium botulinum bacteria this bacteria produces a toxin and that toxin when consumed by these birds they will have their uh, they will have sudden paralysis in their nerves because of that they will die so that's what exactly happened and almost like hundreds and thousands of birds migratory birds that too have died in that lake that's how it became very famous so part of that we'll see what is the importance of sambar lake so the sambar lake is the largest inland salt water body in uh, india and it is located near this near jaipur and then it is surrounded completely by all sides by aravalli hills and the economical aspect of this lake is that it is uh, only source for or the important source for rajasthan salt production and then uh, ecologically it is important because it is an uh, ramsar site and many migratory birds from north asia and siberia especially this flamingos uh, halt there and they feed there for the wintering uh, time okay so this lake also has certain unique features like this lake will have a different colors that come up blossom during different periods this is because of certain action of bacteria and algae producing certain toxins and certain chemicals i'll show you one picture of it i guess i have it in slide yeah so this is how it looks like if you see this sahu movie in that also there was a pink lake you remember in a song that was because also of a certain algae when certain algae releases certain chemicals that lake becomes pink so nowadays even in hyderabad also recently there was a news one lake became all of a sudden pink that usually happens because of certain algae so whenever such news comes try to see what is that algae name because usually we see blue green algae and we usually see blue green color in the river bodies but nowadays this pink algae is also coming up so this is also important and that's how the lake color changes okay so this was sambar lake okay and as we have discussed sambar lake you also need to go through once through all the ramsar important lakes the water bodies like as we have already discussed the koleru lake pulikot and then chilika we have already discussed and then you have uh, vemban lake in kerala which is the longest lake actually and then you have uh, uh, in nal nal sarovar bird sanctuary in the chilika itself so all this try to once again go through those important ramsar sites okay 
so now we'll go with the second topic so as i said this is about uh, redesigning the indian parliament so right now what we have uh, government is planning to do that so consider this question consider the following statements with uh, respect to recently proposed central vista redevelopment project so the first point it involves constructing a triangular parliament building next to the existing one and constructing common and common central secretariat by 2020-22 that is 75th year of independence and second one during delhi darbar of 1914 the shifting of capital of india from kolkata to delhi was announced and third one the circular design of the parliament house is said to be inspired from the 11th century chausat yogini temple in morena district of madhya pradesh and we will see the right solution for this so here as well again i know the third statement is bit tricky because we might not go through this point usually in the history but the second one is something that you should uh, have already you know uh, known whether it is right or wrong because we all read in modern history that it is in 1911 the delhi darbar was done and why delhi darbar was done to actually commemorate the coronation of king george 5 so that's when delhi darbar was done and at that darbar the shifting of capital was from kolkata to delhi was announced and then subsequently done so because of that they commissioned this parliament rashtrapati bhavan all of these buildings so that's why this was part of that or there is a link between this and that history part okay so the second one is wrong here because delhi darbar happened in 1911 so this is these are the kind of facts that you need to you know focus remember whenever you are reading the modern history that's why i've kept this trap okay so here the second one is wrong statement and the first and third were right we will see this chausat yogini temple uh, so the answer is here 1 and 3 that is d so yes so the context is basically union ministry of housing and urban affairs proposed this project called central vista redevelopment and uh, the implementing agency is public works public works department central public works department and basically uh, their main objective was to finish this facelift by 75th anniversary that is 2022 of independence and uh, they are planning three components in it first thing building a triangular parliament just beside the existing one second thing right now if you see the secretariat is in south block and north block secretariat is nothing but the executive authority that is the ministries the external affairs ministry home ministry finance ministry all these ministries so they want a common central secretariat instead of the south block and north block and then they are also revamping this entire rajpath that is between rashtrapati bhavan and india gate there is of a 3 km long stretch that they want to revisit i mean like new trees and all that planning and then you have uh, north and south block to be converted into museums so these are the three things they are planning part of this project and then this was the fact that we already discussed that in 1911 this king george 5 made this announcement and to mark the coronation of this king the delhi darbar was made similarly if you remember there was another darbar also so try to know about that as well in that darbar basically the 1858 act was announced and it was said that uh, from now uh, india will be ruled by british crown so this way try to remember these significant events so now we will see as we are changing the structures we will see first who had built this and what is the architectural importance and this falls under culture aspect so if you see the parliament house right now is basically built under an architecture called indo sarsanic okay indo sarsanic and this word indo sarsanic means it is an amalgamation like mixture of both hindu elements or the traditional princely state architectural elements and the persian elements or the mughal elements along with that you also mix roman architecture so what are roman architecture roman architecture are something like domes big big pillars they will use and in mughal architecture usually there will be kind of canopies and then in hindu architecture you will have all the chatris ja hybrid style so if you see this the front of the palace like uh yeah so the the north and south block have this uh, four massive columns like and uh, these were i guess there is one more slide yes uh, 
so basically the indian parliament building was uh, designed by two main architects that is edwin lutyens and herbert baker so always remember them and that's why it is called uh, lutyens delhi because luton was the architect who was uh, responsible for many buildings there and this as i said this was inspired by chausat yogini temple in morena district of madhya pradesh I'll parliament inspiration was made from this temple so that is why you have to remember this fact as well and it is very important it will be jalis so that is a called as chajas so that also been incorporated and then you have inscriptions from upanishads mahabharat manusmriti even quran were inscribed in this indian parliament and then uh, dome on the passage to central hall has an arabic inscription you don't need to remember what is that but these are the kind of things that have in indian parliament so part of that we'll see indian gate as well so indian gate is basically a war memorial located on the rajpath and it is on the eastern edge and it is basically to commemorate the sacrifices of uh, british india soldiers and uh, officers and especially the who were fought and died in world war 1 that is india gate now recently if you know we have made national war memorial just opposite to india gate so till world war 1 we had this memorial to honor them but after independence we don't have any memorial so that's why in 2018 we have built this national war memorial and uh, you have certain features so try to see that also national war memorial like there were four chakras so you need to know like which chakra first which chakra second and what it represents so it is basically to honor the sacrifices of soldiers who died after independence so that is national war memorial whereas india gate is world war and before that under british india so that is a basic difference and uh, this is uh, constructed by lutens and it is a temporal arc like uh, how in france we had a monument it is on the same lines and then rashtrapati bhavan you all know it is an official residence and it is was built by lutens again and it is on uh, raisina hills so and then uh, it is basically having all the features like circular stone basins chajas and various chatris like the chatris are like umbrella kind of structures these are borrowed from rajput architecture and then you have same thing in front of it you have massive columns and then you have secretariat secretariat you always have to remember like parliament sorry gate and rashtrapati bhavan both are built by lutens whereas secretariat was built by herbert baker and this herbert baker also built same kind of structure in south africa in pretoria so both look very similar like if you even google it the images will be very similar and he incorporated this both mughal and rajasthani elements like already we discussed this chatri and jali these were there in all those structures in and around and the unique feature is that like uh, at that time this secretariat was under british india so british empire consists of these countries like canada australia new zealand so all of them have sent uh, one column each and those columns were there in front of this secretariat now we'll see the third topic okay so consider the following statements with respect to world monument watch list that was in news so first one saurang bavadi bijapur karnataka has entered the world monuments watch list under ancient water system of deccan plateau of world monument funds second one the world monuments watch is an annual selection program of at risk cultural heritage sites that combine great historical significance with contemporary social impact so this was again in news because this was the first time bijapur suranga bavadi was selected for the world monuments watch list so we'll see that in detail but these were inspired from that development so if you have marked your answer then we'll go with the disclosure so here the first one is correct so this was selected that's why it was in news but the second one is wrong because the monuments watch list is something that is generated biennial so that is like for two years every two years not every year so that's why the second one is wrong so this is completely a factual one like if you know you can mark it if not then it will be pretty difficult so here the answer is one only okay so c is the answer here so now we'll see that as i said this saranga body which is situated in bijapur was selected and uh, the importance of this is like this is an important uh, ancient water harvesting system like in india there are several water harvesting system and one out one of them is this saurang saurang bavadi so like as the name itself it is very close to telugu name like saurangam surangam so basically surangam you all know right that is an underground passage so similar to that the same mechanism called karai system was used in this so what they do is 
I'll show you the uh, image. Yeah. So if you see here, all of a sudden the water is coming from that underground tunnel. This is nothing but that Saranga Bavadi. So Bavadi is like a tank where you collect all the water. And Saranga is like underground underground tunnel. And the mechanism is this. Like if you see here, it is a hilly area where the rainwater that falls on all the hills will be collected from the shafts and filtered and then goes through that that tunnel kind of thing or an underground pipe and these water is that way collected and then because of the gravitation they don't use any mechanical pumps or anything so just because of the gravitation the water that was collected subsequently flows through to the downstream and then finally at the end outlet they will have a small tank kind of structure where they will store this water because of this two things will happen one the because of that water collected at that end the groundwater tables will increase second thing you can use this the water that collected for the irrigation purpose so that is an ancient water harvesting system so there might be a question like how it works sarangi bavadi system or there might be a question on other traditional water harvesting system so that's why this is important this is that image yes so we'll see that first so as i said the sarangi bavadi parts forms part of this ancient karaj system okay and then it was built by adil shah one of adil shahi dynasty of bijapur in 16th century that is around in 1500s to supply water to vijayapur and karnataka and karaj is basically that same thing as i told the mechanism using the gravity they'll collect the water and they'll store it and now we'll see what is this world monument watch so world monument watch is biennial selection program of at risk cultural heritage sites so what they do is it is a private organization based out of new york in us so what they do is they will identify uh, the important cultural heritage sites which are at risk in the entire world after they identify they'll publish this list for every 2 years and once they identified in that list they'll provide the funds to restoration of them and protection of them so that is what they will do this is very important because being selected for that means that now we'll get funds to even revive and conserve this kind of traditional harvest system so that is what here so the same thing was written over here and the world monuments fund is that fund it is a private non profit fund to accelerate uh, like conserving the important art artistic treasures throughout the world so that is about this thing and uh, here you have some of the other traditional water harvesting system which you might which you have to know like at least you need to know uh, where it is located what it represents for example fard fard is there fard fard is like a community management irrigation system and it is in maharashtra it is famous in maharashtra so it is a kind of check dam system where subsequent dam check dams kind of thing will be constructed on the canals and rivers and from there the water will be pumped to the agriculture and second you have zing so this is kind of thing that is observed in northeast uh, sorry in the northern part of uh, ladakh and northeastern part of ladakh of jammu and kashmir so where you have all this glacial water that is melting will be collected in small kind of lakes or tanks that is called zing from the name also you can identify that is associated with ladakh similarly you have kuls in himachal pradesh that is also very famous uh, where because of the hilly terrain what they do is they collect the water from glaciers and they direct it through certain streams to the downward areas and then you have ruza or jabu system this is again the same thing but in the northeast in the nagaland areas and all and uh, then you have jackwells so this is of great and uh, great nakobar island nicobar islands where bamboos are used to actually collect the runoff water river like running water will be collected from the bamboos like from the trees and all and they will be directed to the uh, fields and then you have pad system and ari joha joha is again very important it is similar to that check dams basically to recharge the ground water and uh, already there was a question on nahar pines uh, in prelims in 2016 i believe like this is uh, mainly in odisha and uh, bihar area so what they do is they construct certain banks on this over flooding areas so whenever there is over flooding they'll put some embankments and they'll store the water and they will use it in the later areas and then you have jalara and bavari so these are bavari you already have seen like there are many uh, ancient uh, water step wells where you store the water so that is a kind of bavari you have tanka and then kadin and kun so these are some things 
i will share the slide so kindly go through it because i can't explain every one of them in detail but just go through them and the best way to remember them is type each of them in google and see the google image of it and once you see that image then you can easily remember it because if you just study and link it then it will be very difficult so that way you all you need to know is where this is like in which state second thing how it works so both of these things can be understood by seeing the images of them so try to do that are you getting the other slides that i'm sharing like whatever the classes so far we have can can someone put a thumbs up or something so that i can know are you getting the slides okay perfect so try to go through them and uh, see that because that will be helpful for you good the fourth question so this question again was in news because uh, there was 11th uh, brick summit that happened in brazil okay so because of that again bricks was so much in news so part of that we have got this question so consider the following statements with respect to bricks first one new development bank is headquartered in beijing second one in the new development bank each participating country will be assigned one vote and none of the countries will have veto power will have veto power sorry yes and the recent brazilia declaration of bricks is associated with reforming multilateral institutions so kindly mark your answer and then we'll see the uh, solution for this so again here as well like if you have followed that um, current event then you would have known that this brazilia declaration is the very latest declaration that was made in 2019 this brazilia is the uh, city in brazil where this declaration and brics summit happened so this is correct the third statement is correct and uh, also the second statement is also correct that is about new development bank here it is unlike world bank like no country has veto power and every country will have veto power because these are the kind of bank brics countries came together to form basically to challenge the existing uh, international institutions like world bank and imf so that's why they were based on equal principles so that's why you always can say safely that these kind of new banks will have certain equal structure so from that logical connection also you can eliminate if at all there is any bank that comes in the as a part of question so here second and third are correct but the first is wrong the headquarter is not in beijing but it is in shanghai and uh, which bank is in beijing can you guess like there was also already a question on this also it is asian infrastructure investment bank that is in beijing but new development bank is in shanghai so that is a difference so the answer is b 2 and 3 so now we'll see the solution like uh, the important part of brics is that it is not a formal organization there is no formal structure so first of all remember that it is an annual summit it is an informal annual summit that happens between the supreme leaders or the state leaders of all these five emerging nations and so far we had 11 summits and the 11th summit took place in 2019 november in uh, brasilia of brazil and the next summit you know the 12th brics summit is actually scheduled to happen now in this july uh, 20 to 23 in st petersburg of russia so in russia it had to happen but it was postponed and always remember the summits will happen in this order like if you see the brics i said 2011 sorry 2019 in brazil it happened now 20 in russia so where there will be summit next summit it will be in india and then china and then south africa so this way it will rotate the summit venues and the presidencies so whenever a country hosts that they'll also form the part of presidency and uh, yes so these are some facts like the first brics summit took place in 2019 in russia and uh, basically the main objective at that time was to of the brics countries was to reform international institutions and the their achievement is also that they have uh, reformed the quota principle in imf this if you remember we have already discussed like in 2010 there was a major quota reform where developing countries got 6% extra share and india also got improved its share so that is achievement so the important two institutions that were uh, found by brics are first new development bank second one contingency reserve agreement okay so now we'll see both of them so these are like both world bank and imf can you see the difference only the difference is in names like new development bank is like world bank where it will provide funds for the development in these developing countries and for sustainable development projects whereas contingency reserve agreement is basically to avoid balance of payment crisis 
which is a similar function of IMF. So try to remember this way. Basically, these emerging countries are trying to build new institutions so that they can force the existing ones to reform. So that way. So as I said, uh, New Development Bank is headquartered in Shanghai. And uh, the important thing you have to remember with New uh, Development Bank is that it is a 2014 fertilizer declaration that has resulted in creating of this New Development Bank. And this is basically to contribute to sustainable and balanced growth in this developing countries. And second thing, like as I said, each win have one vote and there's no veto power. And these are the key areas of operation of New Development Bank. So just try to go through, don't remember. It's okay if you just can remember even whatever you can like it, the areas are like clean energy, sustainable urban development, economic development among BRICS and member countries, agriculture development, irrigation and transport. So basically whatever are related to sustainable development targets. So these are the key areas of New Development Bank. So now this contingency reserve agreement. So this is basically uh, formed with an intention uh after this 2008 financial crisis so they said like the emerging countries need certain forex reserves so to avoid such kind of crisis so they formed this in 2014 same part of same declaration fortaleza declaration so fortaleza declaration resulted in two institutions one is new development bank second is contingency reserve agreement so it is basically aims to provide short-term liquidity support to all the members through currency swaps so that is big thing and the initial amount committed of CRA was $100 billion. This is also important. And if you see IMF, what is IMF amount? Yesterday only we have seen. It is of 1 trillion. So this is of 100 billion. That is the difference. And then you have Brasilia declaration. This is the latest outcome out of this 2019 summit. And this declaration basically talks about multilateralism. You, if you know that already because of US-China trade war, uh, all the multilateral institutions like WTO, WHO, all are getting affected. So that is why these emerging countries came together and said, we will try to strengthen those multilateral institutions. We will reform them and then we'll support that reform process. So all these are included in this declaration called Brasilia Declaration. So that is this here. If you can see the important organization they are trying to strengthen and reform are United Nations and uh, associated organizations like UNESCO, all of those and then World Trade Organization and IMF to address a significant challenge being faced by developing countries. And the another important feature is Sherpa mechanism. So here Sherpa is something you also need to know because this is a kind of concept that prelims um, UPSC focuses on. So in Sherpa, what they do is every country will appoint a special representative called Sherpa to this uh, multilateral institutions. Like for example, for G20, there is a Sherpa mechanism. For G7, they have and similarly for BRICS. So in this, what they do is uh, the country will assign complete executive or high authority to that Sherpas. So they go on behalf of the country and try negotiate in that arrangement. And they have the power to agree for the any negotiations. So this is called Sherpa. So they go before they negotiate and they make deals. And then finally, these deal will be signed by the head of the states. So that is Sherpa mechanism. This also you need to know, okay? And uh, because we have read this BRICS, similarly, the other institutions important are SEO, BIMSTEC, SARC, and Indian Ocean Commission. Here, Indian Ocean Commission is very, very important this year because India for the first time was appointed as an observer for this commission. So that's why I try to see this as well. So this is basically an island ocean commission of Mauritius, Madagascar, all those islands. If if we get a chance, like if this is in current news, I will also cover IOC, don't worry, SARC and Winstech also, but try to see yourself as well so that you'll get added advantage. Okay, so now we'll see the fifth question. So fifth one basically talks about Sundarban ecosystem and uh, why it is in news is because you all know Cyclone Amphan, one thing. Second thing, it has certain got an important recognition in that 2019 November. So that's why this was in news. So we'll see the question first. For fifth one, consider the following statements with respect to Indian Sundarban ecosystem. First one, it is already recognized as UNESCO World Heritage Site and now been recognized as Ramsar wetland of international importance. Second one, it is home to endangered Northern River Terrapin. This is a uh, turtle, okay? And endangered Iravadi dolphin and fishing cat. 
third one sundarbans are shared among countries of india and bangladesh and indian part contributes up to 60% of india's mangrove ecosystem so these are the three statements so try marking your answer and then we'll see the solution uh, for the purpose of remembering these statements i've kept all the three statements as correct okay so all the three are correct so it is answer is d 1 2 and 3 yes earlier sundarbans was only recognized as unesco world heritage site and bangladesh part of sundarbans was recognized as ramsar wetland of international importance till 2019 it is only bangladesh part was recognized as ramsar site but in 2019 for the first time even the indian part of sundarbans was considered as ramsar site of international importance so that is why it is very very important so it became 27th ramsar wetland of international importance and second thing you all know like already this sundarban is mainly between west bengal of india and bangladesh so there the royal bengal tiger is a famous animal here so apart from that you also have this endangered animals that is northern river terrapin turtle and then you have irrawaddy dolphin and fishing cat so these these status are also important their status is endangered okay and uh, in the entire indian mangrove system the 60 percent of it is of this west bengal sundarbans rest of it is in kutch of gujarat and then you have some in andhra pradesh and then you have in the coast of tamil nadu and uh, uh, kerala so sometimes upsc might ask you like mangroves are only there on the eastern coast of india not on the western coast that is a wrong statement because the mangroves are also there on the west coast so that is also you have to know so here answer is d so now we'll see in detail about this sundarbans so the context we have already seen and uh, the uh, indian sundarban actually met the four out of nine criteria for uh, assigning this wetland of international importance that are first thing it has presence of rare species and threatened ecological communities as i said this terrapin tortoise and all are there second thing biological diversity huge diversity and third thing significant and representative fish and fish spawning ground and fourth thing migration path so these are some of the criteria there are nine criteria which a site has to satisfy like any one of them only then it will be declared as wetland out of that the sundarban has satisfied four that is why it is it was recognized so next thing uh, the important thing is like main three rivers that is meghana brahmaputra and padma these three rivers form this delta called sundarbans and it is called the largest tidal halophytic mangrove forest so what is this halophytic so this word halophytic is technical word which means the plants that can grow in salt water conditions okay the plants that can grow in salt water conditions are called halophytic and tidal you all know like tides come and go so because of that these sundarban trees these mangrove trees will have certain aerial roots where they will take oxygen when there is low tide and then they will be adapting to the saline water so that is why they call tidal halophytic mangrove forest and as i said it is already unesco world heritage site and uh, these are the animals we'll see those animals like it is home to royal bengal tiger and uh, critically endangered northern river terrapin this is the tortoise so try to once again see it like how it looks so go back to google and see the image so that you will better remember it and irrawaddy dolphin with they where the status is endangered and then you have fishing cat of vulnerable status and uh, two of the world's four horseshoe crab species are found in this sundarban that is why this is biologically diverse ecosystem okay and then we will see like what are the criteria like as i said this sundarban satisfied four out of the nine criteria of wetlands international importance so these are the nine criteria don't try to by heart it but just see logically like what are there even if you have a glance if at all upsc asks then it will be easy for you to remember like here also you can see like uh, the first one is representative rare we already seen and it should have vulnerable endangered or critically endangered species and third thing it should contain biologically diverse ecosystem fourth one uh, the animal or species should be at their critical stage like uh, as i said that fish spanning that is a critical thing and then it should have more than 20000 or more water birds and then uh, a population of more than 1% of species of water bird 
and then you have indigenous fish species and then import it should be an important source of food for fishes spawning ground nursery and all and uh, more than one percent of population of one species or subspecies should present in this ecosystem so this is as a whole some of the important criteria where you have to satisfy to select some wetland as an international importance so that is about this so now part of this two important uh, terms are very important so one is umbrella species and the other is keystone species already there was a question on keystone species in upsc so that is why it is very important to know these technical terms so umbrella species is basically uh, it is an like like as the name that suggests umbrella it's like an uh, top of the species where if you conserve this species then entire ecosystem and the species that are dependent on this will be conserved or protected for example why we have this tiger reserves because we all know that tiger is kind of umbrella species so if you protect tiger then you automatically protect all the ecosystem around it so you'll protect the national parks the deers will be protected and then the grass or shrublands will be protected and then you have certain foxes which are also dependent on this that will be protected so this way because you are conserving umbrella species all the other species also will be protected that is the importance so that is umbrella species and then uh, you have keystone species so the keystone species is basically an organism that helps define an entire ecosystem so it is very keystone like if you know the keystone is from architecture like if you have this entrance it will be kind of arc like in the architecture and the main stone in the center will be keystone so if you remove that that entire arc or kind of doorway will fall so that is the importance of keystone so keystone tries to hold the ecosystem sustainability so that's why the term keystone so similarly in forest also these keystone species are very important like if they are extinct or if they are eliminated from that ecosystem then that entire ecosystem will get damaged so that is the importance like uh, and this keystone species term is that they have very low functional redundancy so what is this low functional redundancy that means if that species disappear from the ecosystem then no other species would be able to replace them or fill them that is the importance that is why they call low functional redundancy if it is high functional that means other species can replace it their function that is why low function and second thing the ecosystem will be forced to radically change so like invasive species might come if that species go so that is why this is called keystone so anything from plants to fungi may be a keystone species like one of the question i remember when asked in prelims was it was about uh, some blue green algae as a keystone species and the answer was true because that blue green algae is a kind of keystone species which helps in the entire ecosystem it uh, it helps in surviving the ecosystem of this uh, symbiosis between algae and bacteria that way many species will depend on it so if that is eliminated then entire species or entire habitation will be gone and the species that are dependent on will be gone that's why these are called keystone species so you always have to know this technical concepts as well so similar to this if you have anything in environment so while reading the current affairs also go back to those static concepts and try to once again revise them this way it will be easy for you to revise and also to connect both so now the sixth question so consider the following statements with respect to insolvency and bankruptcy code so first one the ibc at latest stands suspended due to the covid crisis second one the committee of creditors decision has to be approved by at least 75% of the votes for any liquidation or resolution plan and third one the financial creditors are given primacy over operational creditors after the latest development so these are the three things all these three are related to the latest developments with respect to insolvency and bankruptcy code 2016 you all know that this ibc code came in 2016 but after that there were certain amendments brought in and there were certain supreme court judgments and that especially happened in november 2019 and also in the recent past that's why this question like if you know very recently um, our finance minister has proposed that we are going to suspend this ibc for the next 6 uh, months or even 1 year if the situation is bad so that's why the first statement is correct 
and similarly the third statement is also correct because of a supreme court judgment earlier financial creditors and operational creditors both were treated equally but because supreme court said in a case that you can't have equality principle and you have to give importance first to financial creditors so that's why third statement is correct and second statement is wrong here it is true according to ibc act 2016 it was 75 percent but after that there was an amendment brought in and that made decrease the voting uh, approval percentage from 75 percent to 66 percent this was an amendment that was made in 2018 so that's why second statement was wrong so the answer is c one and three now we'll see this in detail like important terms how the resolution happens and then what are the latest developments so the context here as i said the supreme court judgment in accelerator arcelor mittal case that is a steel plant where uh, there was a conflict between arcelor mittal and sr steel to acquire that uh, resolution company okay so there the supreme court gave this judgment that is one thing and then you all know that this ibc was suspended recently so because of these two developments this was in news now important provisions technical terms these are the things that you need to know like at least what represents what for example insolvency professional is basically the licensed professionals and these professionals actually administer the entire resolution process they go to the company assess that uh, debtor company and then provide the information to the tribunals so these are the functions of insolvency professional next you have insolvency professional agencies so these agencies actually certify these professionals so that's why these agencies so these are the agencies which like certify give performance give certain kind of rating to this professionals and then you have information utilities information utilities are like data banks where they have complete information about how much debt is owned by which bank and who are the companies that are going into the debt resolution so these information utilities will have the database so that's why information utilities and then you have adjudicating authorities here it is very important for you to note that the resolution process for companies will be handled by national companies law tribunal okay always remember for companies it is nclt and for individuals it is debt recovery tribunals so these are the two things that handle these things and then you have committee of creditors so committee of creditors creditors means the banks are the one who give money to the uh, companies so they all form a group called committee of creditors these are who approve what resolution should be taken if a plan is submitted so that is why committee of creditors so this is where i said because of an ordinance ibc amendment act 2019 the approval which was earlier 75 percent was reduced to 66 percent and then finally you have insolvency and bankruptcy board so this is like a central board which takes care of regulation of everything like who should be the insolvency professional what should be the guidelines all of these things so that is about these technical agencies that were created under this act so now we'll see the process so the process is basically first like whenever there is a default that is happened then resolution can be initiated by two players one creditors or debtors so creditors are majorly banks debtors are like companies so both of, one of them can go to the nclt and file for resolution and then nclt will appoint this professional insolvency resolution professional and this professional will do all the background search he will assess what is the value everything based on the information from data bank that is information utility and then he submits it to the committee of creditors and this committee of creditors then will see the resolution plan and if they agree then they will vote like if 66 percent more than 66 percent agree then they will go for that resolution plan if they don't agree then that company will go for liquidation that is important liquidation is like complete outright sale so this happens only when the time limit of 330 days is passed like if they fail to approve or complete the resolution plan in 330 days that is 270 days plus 60 days 270 days is the ideal deadline and then you have an extension of 60 days so in total 330 days so if that is violated then you will go for the 
liquidation that is complete outright sale and uh, the precedence how they give is basically first first is insolvency resolution costs that will be covered like how much the insolvency professional had to be paid and all then secured creditors so these are like secured creditors are like banks uh, which have taken the collateral like land or some document they have kept and gave the loan they are called secured creditors so for them they will be covered first and then unsecured creditors these are like other msmes supplying raw material to those companies so they also should get the money so they become third and then reduced to the government and then you have priority shareholders and then finally equity shareholders okay so this is the order so this is what according to the ibc act 2016 and now we will see the latest judgment what uh improvements or what uh, president's uh, supreme court has said first thing is that the primacy should be given to financial creditors over operational creditors this is something you have to remember second thing nclt should not interfere in decision taken by the committee of creditors like if committee of creditors have taken one decision then nclt cannot have any right to again change that decision third thing sc has decided to extend even 330 day limit in specific cases so even if they violate or even if they uh, like go beyond 330 days even then supreme court by case to case basis can even approve that when the delay is caused due to the judicial proceedings so these are the three important uh, provisions that came out of this judgment so that is about insolvency bankruptcy code so try to once again go through it it is very very important at least if not from prelims you might get one question definitely for mains okay so now seventh one consider the following statements with respect to surveillance in india this again was in news because if you know there was a famous attack called pegasus pegasus whatsapp attack you know the the unique thing is like there uh, they can just give you an missed call or missed video call and then if you have that missed video call they can send a virus and from that they can even switch on your camera camera of your phone they can record they can phone tap your calls they can do screen recording everything can they can do in your phone so this is a kind of attack named pegasus pegasus was a company that was sorry pegasus was that attack and this was made by some company israel company and unfortunately this virus or this attack was used by government on certain individuals that's why it became big controversy so part of that the mass surveillance concept was in use so we'll see now that uh, aspects so seventh question consider the following statements with respect to surveillance in india first one the indian telegraph act 1885 provides for interception of data okay second one the information technology act 2000 provides for the interception of calls and third one only government authorities can conduct surveillance and that too after the written approval from official of at least secretary level of ministry of home affairs so these are the three things like as surveillance is being held like what laws allow this right now in the current framework and second thing what is the procedure so on this this question is so try to mark your answer and then we'll see the right solution so i guess you have done so here what i did is basically again the first and second statements have interchanged like the first statement telegraph act deals with interception of calls and the it act deals with interception of data so that's why one and two are wrong here so the third statement is correct here uh, this surveillance whenever you want to tap phone call of certain people like for example right now uh the controversy is going on in rajasthan as well because the rajasthani government had uh, phone tapped certain uh call records so that is why it is also in news so only government authorities can do this phone tapping and that too when they get this approval that too of secretary level only then they can do it so that is a procedure right now so that's why the third statement is correct here so the answer is a and then we'll see this in detail like what are the laws and how it will be happening and all so we have seen already this context like that pegasus malware and uh, the important acts are the first one is indian telegraph act that is 1885 if you know this 1885 is also associated with formation of congress foundation of congress so this is an act of that time which is still relevant right now in india so this is basically to intercept the calls 
whereas IT Act of 2000, uh, which is uh, deals with the interception of data. And IT Act also, you have to remember Section 66A, like that was stricken down by Supreme Court. So these are the things you have to remember whenever such an act comes in. And uh, yes, so under both laws, actually only government that too under certain specific circumstances can conduct the surveillance, not the private sectors. No telecom authority or no private company has any uh, authority to phone tap or do the surveillance on individuals. That is very important to note. And then hacking is expressively prohibited under IT Act. Section 43 and Section 66 of IT Act deals with this criminal and civil offenses related to this. And then you have 66B for punishment of dishonestly receiving stolen computer. So this is kind of offenses. That's why I mentioned. So finally, in 1996, Supreme Court said certain procedures should be followed even if government authorities are conducting surveillance. So part of that, finally, the Ministry of Home Affairs came up with an uh, rules in 2009 okay according to those rules they said only a competent authority can permit or can give the approval for surveillance so then they said who are these competent authorities these are first either it should be secretary from ministry of home affairs or the same secretary in the state who deal with home ministry department so if only these two have the authority to approve any phone tap or surveillance it is not like any SP or any district collector can order this. So only when they get the approval, then they can do it. Finally, in 2018, there was an important development where central government under the same rules, it reissued and said, now 10 central agencies can actually conduct surveillance. That are Intelligence Bureau, NCB, Enforcement Directorate, CVDT, Revenue Intelligence, CBI, NIA, and Cabinet Secretariat, all this. So like this is a new thing which again brought controversy. So you don't need to remember these 10 agencies, but remember this is the latest development that happened. So this is about mass surveillance in concept. And part of this, I would also advise you to know more about data protection bill or Sri Krishna, SN Sri Krishna committee. Right now it is in draft stage. It is not passed, but it is very, very, very important for this year because there are certain concepts in it like data principle, uh, then you have uh, rights for the consumers like right to be forgotten. So you need to know the meaning of that. If possible, I will try to make a slide whenever I come across this bill in the future current affairs. But from your part also, try to once again go through this data framework bill and the important technical terms in it. And second thing, also go through this DNA regulation bill. That is also very important. These two are very important for this year. Okay. So now having covered this, there is one last topic which I want to emphasize like I don't have question, but this topic is important. This is basically new space India limited and right now the commercialization of space industries and trending topic. This was a development then and there in November and also right now in uh, 2020 budget. Also, there was an important program announced by our finance ministry to encourage private sector in space. That's why this is important. So basically our uh, central government has set up this new organization called New Space India Limited. So it falls under Central Public Center Enterprise and it works under Department of Space. Okay, so what is the main function of this organization is it will try to exploit the research and development that is done by ISRO centers. So whatever there, like for example, if there is a lithium ion battery technology that is developed by ISRO, then that will be commercialized, that will be patented and that will be given to other companies to get profits. So to get that, to give them, they'll get certain license fee. This way that company will market the research that is done by ISRO. So that way government will get profit. So this is one of the function. And the other functions are like to give outsource this technology to the private industry for example like uh, uh, manufacturing the launch vehicles for example PSLV because if you see in US NASA doesn't do this uh, work it is like SpaceX or uh, Blue Origin these companies that produce these rockets and NASA use these rockets to send their satellites into the space so similarly India is also planning to outsource the production of rockets to private companies so for this this company was uh, like introduced and you have similarly technology transfer from satellite as well like uh, remote sensing data analyzing 
all these aspects so now having discussed this nsl there is already an existing similar kind of organization called antrix so antrix is also very important so this antrix what it does is any satellite if foreign country wants india to launch then they should contact antrix so antrix is like a commercial arm of isro so they kind of get the inputs from the foreign countries they get the deals they conduct the negotiations and then finally for a price they will launch the foreign satellites for example in 2018 and 19 we have launched 104 satellites in one launch with one pslv rocket so there we have earned some crores of revenue so that is basically done by this commercial corporation called antrix and in 2018 it was awarded with mini ratna status and these are the business activities of antrix like uh, commercial satellite transponders providing launch services for satellites customers and then you have data data uh if you have any satellite data like cartosat and all then if you want to commercialize then you give it to foreign companies and private companies and then for all the mission support activities and all all these are taken by antrix so even now antrix is there apart from this nsil is there nsil basically deals with commercialization of space research and outsourcing the launch vehicles this you have to remember the difference okay and now there is another bill that was recently there in draft stage that is some space bill where they are having new provisions that also try to know because these are kind of trending topics and uh, finally i would suggest you also to know more about asat test okay we have conducted this test called mission shakti okay and uh, where we have launched an uh, weapon to destroy satellite that is orbiting that is in live satellite so that's why it is very important so try to know that as well even i might cover that whenever it comes in current affairs but i'm just giving you an update